Good afternoon to all of you. It's fall here in New York City and everywhere uh, else from where you're tuning in. Um, Middle East, a little dreary out there today uh, with some rain, uh, though of course, no, we're lucky comparatively relative to some of the rain that uh, has been traversing the country, particularly in our Southeast and in uh, Puerto Rico, and we'll touch on that in a bit. Um, but you know, fundamentally what we wanted to make sure you knew is that you know every week we're here to give you the updates um, and what I will cover um, we'll talk about in the agenda in just a moment so if Kathy you could go to that agenda slide I'd appreciate it please and there it is thank you so what I'm going to touch on are the typical uh, updates I bring to you around uh, where things stand with COVID and other public health issues I'm going to spend a minute on the healthcare worker bonus program which is one that we've been presenting to you um, on you know, for a number of weeks, and we just want to keep uh, all of you focused on it as it pertains to you. Then Barbara Lee, who's back with us, uh, will be presenting on cannabis on campus and uh, discussing personnel implications. Uh, this is part of a series of presentations that Barbara has brought before uh, all of you, and uh, I'm excited to hear it. I think it'll be very informative. Michael Donlin has joined us as well, um, and he'll be covering um, an announcement from the SEC concerning new disclosure requirements. Um, I expect it'll be uh, particularly informative for those of you um, working in the public company space and uh, others who want to learn more about that. And then Sam Dobre is back. He was with us two weeks ago, and uh, now he's going to be uh, discussing the appellate division's interpretation of New York City's freelance law. That has interesting uh, implications, uh, particularly um, as we uh, learn more about how the appellate division's uh, decision making affects uh, both what happens here in the city and uh, potentially, you know, statewide ripples. So uh, with that, why don't we go to uh, the next slide? Um, and I should note as well that as we have time, I'll also touch on the Supreme Court, um, but we want to focus first on public health. And so in terms of the COVID picture, what we're seeing nationally is a continuing downward trend. And that is of course reassuring. Um, we know uh, that the numbers that we're uh, analyzing are not as good as they were in many key respects because of all the in-home testing. Um, but you know, what we do know suggests that COVID is uh, certainly on the wane as it relates to you know where things stand you know summer moving into fall what comes in the fall and winter uh, we shall see uh, but this is all good news uh, again a 24 percent uh, drop since the last time I was with you two weeks ago in terms of national data why don't we go to the next slide please and you'll also see uh, thank you Kathy that hot spots have really diminished in uh, quite a uh, visually obvious way. Um, in the uh, middle of the country, particularly um, you know, in and around the Tennessee, Kentucky uh, area, there is a focal area. Then as well, we see a bit of um, you know, heightened activity in the um, Rocky Mountain area. But outside of that, things are calming down across the country in terms of the data that we have anyway. Um, so uh, this is all uh, good news for now. Next slide, please. And in New York State, um, what we know is that there is a diminishment overall in COVID, which is great, and uh, also that we're seeing some level of stasis when it comes to the numbers. Um, right now, if you go back two weeks ago to where we are today, um, there's only a 1% uh, change in the rate of uh, cases and, uh, sorry, the, the test positivity rate, excuse me. And so that suggests um, very strongly that um, things in New York are getting to a place of you know, better management. And uh, again, as we live with this virus, uh, we figure it out uh, day by day, week by week. Um, things that we'll be watching, of course, on all of your behalf and that may lead to public health relating um, exercises of emergency orders and the like, you know, as we've seen in these last couple of years, um, the Omicron booster uh, uptake is certainly lagging relative to what some public health experts were hopeful to see. Um, it's widely available, as I reported out uh, to you in a previous uh, uh, webinar, but uh, there hasn't been uh, really the kind of uptake relative to the volume available. And we're also back to what will be a 
in all likelihood standard seasonal flu season. So those compounding factors may make for um, a more complex fall and winter. But again, we shall see how this all plays out. Uh, and this is what we know for now. Next slide, please. Uh, the two-week differentials in New York are, as I described broadly, uh, where you know we are seeing um, you know some changes um, from county to county and uh, geographic area, but the numbers are all really small um, relative to what we were dealing with at other uh, times during this. Uh, arc that we've been living with COVID. And so um, small numbers, we certainly will take and uh, we're glad for them. And so uh, we'll keep all of you updated. Next slide, please. Monkeypox and polio, of course, I've discussed with you previously. And uh, unfortunately, they are still here with us. Um, Monkeypox, good news is that while there are 26,000 or so confirmed cases across the United States and others uh, overseas, um, the infection rates are dropping. Um, and there are a number of theories as to why, um, including just the public health awareness and uh, the changes in uh, ways that people are um, approaching both the virus and the risks. Um, and so uh, that's all relatively good news as compared with what we had to report out previously. And then on polio there, uh, there's still a, a very extensive uh, nature of monitoring happening. Uh, in New York State, where you know there is what is understood to be community spread in downstate counties, including New York City, where I speak with you from, as well as into the Hudson Valley. So um, more on that as it relates to your operations and otherwise um, ways in which it impacts uh, the way you do your business um, as we learn more. But just please be aware that isn't unfortunately going away. Next slide, please. And I alluded at the top of this uh, webinar to the fact that there have been some terrible storms uh, that have uh, crossed our country in the last few days. And uh, we are, of course, you know, uh, aware of the, the destruction in Puerto Rico and, uh, you know, in specific, uh, President Biden was uh, just down in Puerto Rico yesterday uh, to discuss Fiona and the aid that he's committed to ensuring that uh, gets to the island. And we also, in the bond community, um, where you know, we have representation and in, in office in Florida, as well as we know those tuning in from there, um, you know, the devastation is you know, really just unfathomable on the western coast of Florida. And you know, we are with all of you as you're working to recover. And uh, if there are ways that we can be helpful with your legal needs in that context, of course, please reach out to those attorneys you trust. Um, but we wish you above all else, uh, safety as you navigate uh, these difficult times. Next slide, please. And so the healthcare worker bonus, I mentioned that I was going to come to it. So a couple updates. First big one is that we've crossed the threshold into October. And with that, the second vesting period um, is open uh, with a close date of October 31st. So that's for all of those who weren't part of the uh, group that was essentially told, let's wait until October. Uh, that one uh, primarily composing you know, those with education ties and uh, you know, some with governmental ties, um, those that were essentially carved out from the main program. That carve out group is ostensibly now eligible uh, to begin the process of filing. We had expected that we would see some more uh, definitive guidance uh, from uh, relating state agencies uh, concerning this, um, and we're tracking that very closely. There are some general guidance that's been out there uh, for a while uh, from uh, the state's Department of Education, essentially, uh, you know, to the extent that um, the health. Uh, I'm sorry, the Department of Health's portal is up and operational. And if individuals have the credentials to log into it, that's a place where education providers can enter data that accord with the standards of the program. But there's a lot more that we all wanna learn uh, here at Bond on your behalf in terms of uh, what the distinctions will be um, relative to this uh, group that you know, includes many of our clients who were told to wait. Um, and so as we get more information, there are a number of us on the bond team who are monitoring this closely and we'll be updating you regularly in this webinar. And as well, you know, we expect through blog posts and the like on what new information we have that would be germane to your reporting requirements. So with that, let's go to the next slide, please. 
Kathy, and thank you for that. And that gives me an opportunity to uh, introduce Barbara Lee, who's back with us uh, and is uh, here to talk further about cannabis. Uh, to remind all of you, Barbara um, works uh, in our education team and is extraordinarily esteemed herself uh, with you know, many years of practice um, in higher ed. And uh, she's co-authored um, and for decades regularly updated a treatise uh, entitled The Law of Higher Education, um, which has a significant following uh, among those uh, who turn to it as the guide in the area. So um, Barbara has been really uh, studying uh, the cannabis industry and its uh, relationship to higher ed quite closely and has updates for us as relates to personnel. I look forward, Barbara, to learning uh, with the group uh, what you have to share today. And thank you for coming back. Thank you, Gabe. It's nice to be back. As you know, I'm sure, New York, like many other states, has decriminalized marijuana. While this is good news for a lot of people, there's one sector that will be facing more complex issues as a result of the decriminalization of marijuana, and that is colleges and universities. Next slide, please, Kathy. Thank you. So before we get into the nuts and bolts of what the issues are for colleges and universities, I thought it might be helpful to explain what cannabis is and the difference between marijuana and hemp because it makes a huge difference with respect to legal compliance. So cannabis, as you can see, is a type of plant that has three different species of flowering uh, flowers. Um, marijuana is a general term for the plant that produces female uh, flowers and has something in it called tetrahydrocannabinol. Um, you can say that three times, maybe. I'm not sure I can, but I'm just gonna call it THC. <clears throat> and THC is the main psychoactive chemical in marijuana that produces the user's high. Hemp, on the other hand, <clears throat> which is also a form of cannabis, uh, is derived from male cannabis plants, no flowers, and contains less than 0.3% THC usually. And the usually is an, a, a challenge for colleges and universities and frankly for others as well. Next slide, please, Kathy. Thank you. So simply because marijuana has been decriminalized in New York doesn't mean that it's okay under federal law. The Controlled Substances Act still under federal law prohibits the sale or possession of schedule one drugs of which marijuana is one. And if that weren't enough to worry about for colleges and universities, the Drug Free Schools and Communities Act amendments actually require students, schools, excuse me, colleges and universities to implement and enforce drug and alcohol prevention programs and policies as a condition of receiving federal funds. And this includes federal student aid. And those colleges and universities that do not comply with the Drug Free Schools and Communities Act could see all of their federal funds re removed. And that is a very serious issue for colleges and universities and certainly for their students who rely on the federal student aid programs. Next slide, please, Kathy. Thank you. One issue that is troubling is the, um, I'm gonna use the word conflict between the desire of the cannabis industry, not just in New York, but all over the country where cannabis has been decriminalized to get people trained to work in the industry. And some colleges and universities do offer degree or certificate programs in uh, the business of cannabis or the science of cannabis. And this is a little awkward because even in states where um, marijuana is legal for both medical and uh, recreational purposes, the federal law still prohibits the use of cannabis if it has more than 0.3% THC. So that means that these institutions that, for example, would like to uh, develop curricula on the science of cannabis cannot use uh, cannabis for research unless they have uh, a federal license from the Food and Drug Administration, because the Food and Drug Administration regulates Schedule I drugs, and marijuana under federal law is considered to be a Schedule I drug. Now, hemp can be used for research, but it's not marijuana. And it has different properties from marijuana, including not very much, we hope, TSC. And I'll explain in a minute why I say we hope it doesn't have uh, above 0.3% THC 
because if hemp does, then it is considered, again, a Schedule One drug and therefore cannot be present on campus, either use for use or possession. The next slide, please, Kathy. Thank you. So what are we going to do about research uh, on the effects of marijuana? You know, it's interesting, the federal government says, we don't have very much research on whether or not medical marijuana is effective. And yet they do not permit that kind of research to be done. It's very difficult to get a license from the Drug Enforcement Agency uh, to be able to uh, conduct research on marijuana. And that means that um, it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy that we don't have enough information on the medical benefits if there are some. And a lot of people believe that there are a number of medical benefits from marijuana um, that we don't have the information from the federal government that's been uh, vetted by them to allow doctors to prescribe marijuana. So for example, because marijuana is not an approved drug, physicians cannot just prescribe it, even in those states where marijuana has been legalized. And so these requirements that I'm just talking about, the Drug Enforcement Agency and the FDA um, apply in every single U United States state, even in those states that have legalized um, the possession and sale of marijuana. So you can see the conflict here between state law and federal law, and it makes it extraordinarily difficult for colleges and universities to uh, try to find out whether marijuana is useful for medical purposes because we have these very strict federal laws making it very hard to do that. Next slide, please, Kathy. So what are we going to do about employees? New York just came out with regulations uh, describing how employers must deal with um, employees who use now legal marijuana in New York State, not on the job, they can still forbid that, but on their own time, um, it is not illegal in New York State to use marijuana now unless you're using it at work, which is still prohibited. Employees in state safety sensitive jobs, such as bus drivers, truck drivers, <clears throat> other folks who operate equipment um, are regulated by the US Department of Transportation. So the regulations that apply to them um, are still the federal regulations and would not conflict with the, uh, they, they would supersede any New York law with respect to DOT regulations. And federal disability law uh, considers marijuana to be an illegal drug under federal law. So it, federal disability law be, uh, does not require employers to uh, allow or permit medical marijuana as a reasonable accommodation under the Americans with Disabilities Act. But state laws may differ. And there's some litigation in other states. I've not seen any in New York yet, but there's litigation by students, for example, nursing students who have um, permission to use med medical marijuana and medical marijuana is legal in their state, but they are drug tested at just as student athletes are. And if they uh, hit positive for marijuana, they could actually be tossed either from the football team or from their nursing program. So again, this conflict between state and federal law is a real problem. Next slide, please. Thank you. Now let's talk about something called CBD. CBD comes from hemp and it's legal in all 50 states if it contains less than 0.3% THC, which is the, the uh, substance in marijuana that gives you the high. And a lot of people use CBD. It, uh, it's legal, it's easy to get. You can buy it online, you can buy it in a store, you can buy it lots of places. The problem is that CBD is not regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. And the FDA has conducted scientific tests that show that a lot of samples of CBD have more than 0.3% THC in them, which again, violates federal law and means that uh, the, whatever the package says the THC uh, content is, is wrong, which means that the consumer can't really be confident about what is in the THC that they are either rubbing on themselves or ingesting as gummies, for example. Also, uh, the NCAA, which um, regulates intercollegiate athletics, 
prohibits the use of CD, CBD, flatly prohibits it, even though it is legal. And therefore, if student athletes use CBD because it's uh, apparently helpful for uh, dealing with pain, sore muscles, that sort of thing, if they use CBD that contains more than 0.3% of THC, they could fail a drug test and be dismissed from the team. So CBD is not regulated, as I said, by the FDA, and thus it's not a drug. So again, uh, it's not necessary for an employer to agree to a reasonable accommodation for CBD use, even though it's legal in all 50 states. So that is the end of my presentation. And I know that I have left you with more questions and I don't have answers for every single one. We are trying to work our way through this. Uh, we do know that um, universities and colleges in New York State are planning um, cannabis and marijuana business certificate programs. Um, the university that I work at, Rutgers University in New Jersey, their law school is doing the same thing. Now, I don't think the lawyers are doing research on marijuana, but they're certainly training uh, people to work in the business of um, cannabis. And it will be interesting to see if the Department of Justice turns away, uh, doesn't try to uh, enforce the federal law, because so far, as far as we know, it has not. That could change with a new administration or a new attorney general. We just don't know. But we thought it was important to let you know what's going on in the area of cannabis on campus. And stay tuned, because I think it's going to be a bit of a bumpy ride. Well, thank you for that. And Barbara, I appreciate the disclaimer that we don't have all the answers, but that you've brought good information to this group is very much appreciated. And please come back as uh, we all learn more and as there is uh, more to share. And what I'll do now is shift to our next speaker, who is Mike Donlin. And uh, Mike is a member of our firm uh, who sits in Buffalo. And uh, he is here to talk about uh, SEC uh, disclosure requirements, uh, but it's important to mention that uh, Mike in his practice uh, focuses on a variety of aspects of corporate and securities law, including governance, executive compensation, um, equity incentive arrangements, and uh, other matters that certainly make him uh, well situated to provide this update. So Mike, thank you for joining us. Welcome to Business in 22 and the floor is yours. Great, thanks Gabe. Appreciate the, uh, the invitation. Um, I'm not so sure whether people might need some medical marijuana to get through my presentation here. I'm not sure if Barbara will say that's uh, permitted or not, but uh, hopefully we will not make anybody uh, too painful or put them to sleep with this presentation here. So the uh, SEC has adopted some new disclosure rules that um, uh, originated back in 2010 under the Dodd-Frank uh, Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. Uh, the, uh, we are sitting here 12 years later before the rules finally became effective. Uh, they were initially proposed by the SEC back in 2015, um, and no action was taken as a result um, uh, at the end of that comment period. Um, there was a little gap in between there. I don't know what happened for four years between 2016 and 2020, but um, uh, I guess maybe the new administration picked up where we left off and uh, reopened the comment period just earlier this year. And the rules finally became adopted uh, at the end of August and they become effective um, a week from today on the 11th of uh, November uh, of October. And they become uh, the, the disclosure will become required beginning in proxy statements that will be filed uh, for years that end after December 16th of this year. Um, Kathy, if you can go to the next slide. So what are the new disclosure requirements? Um, for those who might not be familiar with the federal securities laws, um, you know, companies that are registered under the Securities Exchange Act of 1934 are required to uh, file a, a bunch of different disclosure documents, annual reports, quarterly reports, uh, current reports of, of material information. 
And another classification is your proxy statements. And you might be familiar with receiving proxy statements if you're an investor in companies. Uh, that is the document that is sent out to you either in mail or electronically for you to vote on matters at the annual meeting of shareholders. Uh, the proxy statement includes a lot of executive compensation information. Um, back in 2006, the, uh, there was a major change to the executive compensation disclosure where they added a uh, compensation discussion and analysis to accompany the tabular disclosure of executive compensation, which would have been historically required to be disclosed. Um, this new requirement here is to take the uh, information that you report on executive compensation and try to tie it together with company performance. Um, the disclosure may be included in the CDNA section of the proxy statement, but it is not required to be there. It just needs to accompany the proxy statement um, for the annual meeting. The, uh, there's three major requirements under these new rules here. One is a universal tabular uh, disclosure that all companies are, are gonna be subject to, where you're gonna be reporting certain information with respect to executive compensation, uh, certain information with respect to uh, financial performance measures, both for the company and, and uh, for a peer group, and um, uh, also have to be reporting the, uh, the company's net income. Uh, I'll go into that a little bit greater detail later in the presentation. Kathy, if you can go to the next slide, the, uh, the other two major um, disclosure requirements are, is a, <clears throat> excuse me, an explanation, um, which can either be narrative or graphical in nature, explaining the <clears throat> CEO and the other uh, executive officers compensation relative to um, the, um, uh, the, the peer group uh, relative to the net income that is disclosed and relative to the other uh, financial performance measures that are disclosed. Uh, that is to <clears throat> try to provide a little bit more color to the, uh, the, the standard tabular disclosure there. And this is where you'll see a lot of companies will um, differ in their, their approach as to how they uh, disclose the, the, or, or provide this explanation or, um, or, or description of, of, their, of these relationships between compensation and performance. Uh, the, the last major dis new disclosure requirement is a, a list, um, uh, which is uh, through the comment period became an unranked list of the most important financial performance measures um, that are being used uh, to, to link pay and performance. The, uh, the SEC has said that uh, they do not want you to throw the kitchen sink into there. So they want uh, at least three, but no more than seven key uh, financial measures that are used to um, measure company performance, measure individual and company performance in setting executive compensation. Uh, next slide, please. So here is the uh, uh, tabular disclosure that is required to be included in the proxy statement. <clears throat> Um, the SEC likes to use uh, different definitions or, or, or acronyms that might not uh, be readily apparent to, to many people here, but your, um, your PEO is your, the SEC says it's your principal executive officer. For most people, it's your chief executive officer or CEO. And then they have uh, a classification of the next tier of executives known as named executive officers, which is typically your chief financial officer in your next three highest compensated executive officers. Um, in this tabular disclosure of pay versus performance, uh, you report CEO compensation individually, and then you average the other uh, um, named executive officers um, in, in, in these columns here. The requirement for um, uh, the compensation is both the traditional disclosure of compensation as, as has been included in proxy statements, <clears throat> excuse me, for a number of years um, in the summary compensation table. 
And then they introduced the new concept of compensation that's actually paid. And the reason why they made this distinction between the traditional disclosure of um, total compensation in a summary compensation table versus this new actually paid compensation is because um, it, it appears from time to time our legislative branch does not quite follow what our executive branch is doing. And the statute, which was uh, which created this new disclosure requirement, was all of one sentence long. And they used the phrase compensation actually paid. And the SEC in crafting the rules said um, Congress must have purposely chose that phrase actually paid because they knew that our compensation stroke um, disclosure requirements have been in place for a, a number of years and they did not reference our total compensation definition. So they want something new. So they went to great lengths to try to meet the statutory mandate here by reporting both the traditional SEC definition of compensation and this new definition of compensation that's actually paid to, to individuals in the year in question. Uh, you also have columns, as I said, for the summary compensation disclosure for the um, average of the other named executive officers and then the actual paid column for them as well. Um, the performance part of this pay versus performance table is on the right-hand side where you have your uh, requirement to disclose the company's total shareholder return for the year, um, and as well as the total shareholder return for a peer group of companies. The, um, both of those will be reported on the basis of a, a hypothetical investment of $100 at the beginning of the performance period, and um, will show the change in value of, of total shareholder return, both for the company and the peer group uh, as a increase or decrease on that $100 investment. The net income is um, going to be just your, your gap um, calculation from your uh, income statement. Uh, I, I note that um, uh, a lot of companies do not use net income as a performance measure. Um, because of um, just the, the, the nature of the industry that they might be practicing in. For example, um, real estate companies uh, typically do not look at net income because of the disproportionate effect of uh, depreciation in calculating net income. Uh, they typically use a, a measure called um, funds from operations or FFO. Um, but since the SEC is looking to try to normalize this disclosure, they're requiring everybody to disclose net income in this table, regardless of whether you use it as a um, performance measure or not. And then the last column in this uh, tabular disclosure will be the um, most important um, financial measure that uh, the company uses to, to link executive pay uh, to company performance. If we go to the next slide, Kathy, we will see um, the, the next requirement, as I mentioned before, was this uh, narrative or graphical explanation of the uh, pay versus performance. Using that table as the guide here, you are required to um, discuss the CEO and the average of the other executive officers actual paid compensation to the company's total shareholder return, uh, comparing those same uh, compensation numbers to the peer group total shareholder return, and then also comparing it to the company's net income and comparing it to the company selected financial performance measure. Uh, this information, as I said, could be done either in a narrative format or in a graphical format. While these the, the statutory mandate for these rules came out in 2010, um, a number of companies had voluntarily started to provide this information even before the regulatory process unfolded. Uh, so you have a lot of companies using their proxy statement, which going back, you know, say 20 years or so, Proxy statement was a pretty generic document that just solicited votes uh, on proposals to be considered at the annual meeting. 
Now it's becoming much more of a, what I'll call a marketing document. Uh, companies are going to, you know, greater lengths to make the document more visually attractive, uh, easier to, to read, goes into areas that are um, more optional rather than mandatory disclosure. Uh, companies are including a lot of information about their, uh, their historical or, or recent performance, um, how they're doing from a, um, on the, what we call the ESG standards, the environmental, social, and governance issues. Um, and the, 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 they take the, the CDNA section, the compensation discussion and analysis to, to really tell a story as to how they're doing. So I would expect them to continue to do so in this um, pay versus performance section to try to put your best foot forward and e explain exactly how the company has developed their compensation program in a way to try to um, um, be reflective of the, 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 the company performance. Um, if we go to the, the next slide, um, this is just the last requirement for most public companies that they have to li list uh, three to seven performance measures here. The SEC has very specific disclosure requirements um, um, with whenever you use uh, anything that is non-GAAP in nature. And, uh, you know, traditionally, a lot of company performance measures are uh, make adjustments to a gap number in order to, to calculate it, whether that be EBITDA, which um, uh, takes gap net income and, and adjusts it for um, depreciation, uh, taxes, uh, et cetera. Uh, you are permitted under the rules to include non-financial measures in this, um, so long as your tabular disclosure lists the most important financial measure in it. So you can include environmental, social, and governance or other matters that might be uh, important in um, in setting up the, the compensation program, but you do not need to, um, uh, you, you're, you're free to make a choice on that as you, as you see it fit. Go to the next slide. Um, real quick, there's scaled disclosure rules for companies that are smaller reporting companies. Um, I, I won't go into great detail here, but they're available on the, the slides for anybody who's interested in, in seeing them. Um, they just make it a little bit easier for companies who need to um, match up their historic disclosure requirements to these new rules here. If we forward two slides, uh, Kathy, we'll get to some action items that I think are important for companies to focus on here. Um, one is, I mentioned before, the SEC has a new definition of actually paid compensation. So that will require companies to go and do a second calculation uh, in addition to their traditional calculation of summary compensation. Um, that will require, you know, possible some work from uh, outside actuaries, uh, your internal um, finance or accounting teams to, to gather that information together. The peer group analysis, um, the, the, there are instances already in the existing rules where you have a peer group disclosure, but you do need to have that be vetted through your, your um, uh, compensation consultants and your compensation committee to make sure that the peer group that you're using for this is, is appropriate uh, for purpose of the, these new disclosure rules. Uh, identifying the new, uh, the most important financial performance measures. Some companies have already had this well developed. Others might need to give it a little bit more thought so they can articulate exactly which performance measures they are using to set executive compensation. If we go to the last slide here, um, uh, as I said, you just, it's just new disclosure requirements. There are uh, every quarter and specifically on an annual basis as well, the, um, the CEO and the CFO of public companies are required to certify the effectiveness of their disclosure controls and procedures. This is just one new requirement on top of it. So they need to make sure that their team is preparing the information in accordance with the new rules so that they can individually certify the effectiveness of their controls and procedures and getting this information in the proper format disclosed to the shareholders so that they can make an informed decision in the proxy statement. Uh, to the extent that you do put this disclosure in the CDNA section of it, 
I just want to remind people that the compensation committee has an obligation to certify that portion of the uh, proxy statement. So that will be one interesting point as to whether people put it in the CDNA or put it somewhere else in the proxy statement so as not to require the compensation committee of the board of directors to, to certify the information as well as management to certify the information. Um, I know that there's a lot of information that I went through um, in relatively quick order here, but I will hand it back to, to Gabe and um, uh, happy to answer any questions if there are any. Mike, thank you. That was really informative and we appreciate the time you took to walk the group through. Let me quickly turn to Sam Dobre, who's here uh, to discuss the appellate division's interpretation of the city's uh, freelance law. Sam, the floor is yours and take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Gabe. And thanks everybody for joining us today. So update in one of the New York City law, the New York City Freelance Isn't Free Act, we'll call it the FIFA. Recently, the first department of the Supreme Court Appellate Division, in a matter of what was first impression uh, in being interpreted by the court in a context of a motion to dismiss, um, the, the case is titled Chen vs. Ramona Caveza Collection. It's a high-end uh, luxury fashion brand. And in this case, the plaintiffs were a photographer and a model, and they sought to recover payments for services that they rendered to the high-end luxury fashion brand. And they claimed that the uh, company violated FIFA by improperly withholding payments. And the appellate division ruled that an individual's representation by an agency or an agent doesn't necessarily disqualify the worker from the FIFA freelance worker protections. So the central issue in this case before the appellate division was whether the plaintiffs, the photographer and model, who um, could be classified as a freelance worker entitled to those protections because they were represented by a modeling agency. So you may be asking, what is the Freelance Isn't Free Act? The, this act was enacted in 2016 and became effective in May of 2017. And the act is a first of its kind in this country, which was designed to provide legal protections for freelance workers against non-payment for work performed. Um, FIFA established certain protections for freelance workers, which include a number of things, but just a few were uh, a written contract for, for freelance projects timely and complete payment for certain services, and then protection from retaliation for exercising any rights under the FIFA law. So under FIFA, a freelance worker may file an administrative complaint before bringing an action in court, but filing an administrative complaint is not necessarily a prerequisite, and they can file a complaint in court directly. So now you may be asking, what does it take to be protected under FIFA? So there are two things that need to be done here. First, the individual or freelance worker must meet the definition of a freelance worker. And then the employer must meet the definition of what is a hiring party. So what's a freelance worker? FIFA defines a freelance worker as any natural person or organization composed of no more than one natural person, whether or not incorporated or employing a trade name that is hired or retained as an independent contractor providing a hiring party services in exchange for compensation. Uh, in the Chen case, the, the high-end fashion brand argued that the plaintiff wasn't a freelance worker, but rather an employee of the modeling agency, and that the modeling agency was the hiring party and not the high-end luxury brand. However, the court held that the plaintiff's status as a freelance worker would ultimately be a question of fact. So what does it take to become a hiring party under the FIFA law? FIFA defines a hiring party as any person who retains a freelance worker to provide services. There are certain exceptions. Um, if a hiring party violates FIFA, then the freelance worker can either file a complaint with the New York City Department of Consumer and Worker Protections, Office of Labor and Policy Standards, or they can file the complaint directly in court. Some key takeaways and recommendations from this case and the law itself. All employers across all industries hiring any freelance workers should consider implications and protections under FIFA, especially when utilizing a talent agency or staffing agency. The, the decision would mandate contractual forms and additional terms for certain businesses that do use freelance workers, making 
uh, more likely for legal issues surrounding the use of freelancers to grow. So all employers or quote unquote hiring parties should consider taking protective steps uh, with any current or future contracts in New York City for any freelance workers. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Gabe. Thank you so much, Sam. Really do appreciate your quick uh, summary there. And for those who are looking for more, um, please reach out to Sam directly. And otherwise, uh, know that Sam will be back on the program as uh, he has additional information to report. And uh, <clears throat> I know that as well, we're uh, at time. We want to be respectful of your time. So I'm going to defer for a future program uh, some additional material that I uh, was going to touch on with the Supreme Court. Suffice it to say, uh, they're in a new term and uh, there's a lot that we'll be watching on your behalf. But for now, please contact any of the attorneys uh, whose names appear here who presented or uh, the bond attorney with whom you have the strongest working relationship. If you have questions and follow up, we're here to help and we look forward to having you back in a week. I'll be with you in about two weeks time. So in the meanwhile, stay safe and thank you for taking the time to tune in today.